sixth and final panel of the day. Um, thank you all very, very much for being here. And um, please join us uh, after the panel for our closing party at Christopher Guy. Just a hop, skip, and a jump from here. And um, again, thank you all for being here. We've had an incredible day today. And I think this is going to be um, an outstanding send off. So here we go. Here's Francis. <laughs> thank you, Mallory. Great to see you all here. Um, yeah, this is this is this. We hope will be the firecracker of a panel to uh, to to go out on. Really thrilled to have the three very interesting people on the panel. Um, our topic is simple. Stefan will tell me it's stupid that the question is stupid, but the question <laughs> the question is why art, or rather, why is art so dominant now? When the Broad opened, I heard from an art, um, a museumologist, there's a discipline called museumology, that in the last 15 years, we'd seen more museums opened than in the last 150 years. Why have we seen so many museums open? We all know there's a just explosion of art fairs. There's an there's a art market that's just going out of control. And yet, sort of, what all is all this art, and what does it mean, and what, what relevance does it have? I've, I've just been finding myself just sort of curious about it, and one goes to global capitals, and where cities used to have all sorts of, all sorts of bases for existing. In LA, it used to be aerospace, you know? Um, it now seems to be art. LA, it's art. Berlin, it's art. London, it's art. Uh, New York, it's art. So, so what is all this art about? Um, that is our question, that's what we're going to ask. Um, I'm thrilled to be joined by Carolina Miranda, a good friend, she's a fantastic writer. Sharp as attack, sharp as attack, don't cross Carolina. Los Angeles Times staff writer, editor of the Culture High and Low blog. At the end, Stefan Simkowitz, he's quite a well-known name, um, <laughs> who definitely enjoys, enjoys playing with, the, with, with, with what it is to, to be engaged with art. He's CEO at Simcor, art collector, curator, advisor. He's obviously had a whole career in movies as well. To my immediate left, Stephen Goldberg, a cog in the machinery of, of the art industry. He's an art attorney. He specializes in art law, and he also writes a regular column for artillery magazines. Stephen and I got to know each other when we met at the new objectivity opening at LACMA, a show that I found to be incredibly powerful. S Stephen did too. And it was such a sort of em emotionally powerful show and it got me thinking about sort of what, what, is the, what is the point of painting. And I actually talked to Michael Govan about it and I said, w where are the painters today who are doing what this, the, this school of, of painters were doing? And he said, painting is dead. Um, so anyway, that was just another pot thing that played in my mind, sort of, sort of, I'm trying to just get my head around it. I feel as if there's other people who are also sort of perplexed by, by what's going on. I am going to say that when I spoke with Stefan yesterday, first of all, he told me why art was a stupid question. And he said, you need to rename the panel the bonsai tree. And then he said, bring a bonsai tree. There was no time to get a bonsai tree between yesterday's phone call and today's panel. So I'm just going to tell him that in this painting behind him, I think this is a bonsai tree. <laughs> um, <laughs> but Stefan, if you could just kick off by telling us why this should not have been called Why Art and it should have been called the bonsai tree, and we'll go from there. So basically, There's a microphone. So basically, I like using the analogy of a tree, a bonsai tree, an oak tree. I mean, she was like... Why not an oak tree? I'm like, because it won't fit in the room. But a tree has a, has a trunk, and then it, it has a, a, a limb, and another limb, and another limb, and then the limbs have limbs, and then they have, have leaves, et cetera. And the institutional expansion, the square footage expansion that's happened all over the world institutionally, is really a function of, essentially, the tree branching out and filling out in, 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 in sort of the, the post-war period, fueled by capital, fueled by globalization, fueled by the distribution of images that is uh, uh, sped along through social media, the internet, by the ability for networks to handle large amounts of data, image data. And this has essentially created a construct where we can see the expansion of cultural distribution and cultural production through the global environment 
encourage essentially the physical expansion of just retail exhibition space, not just institutionally, but also in the gallery and retail system. And I think the bonsai tree is a, is a really elegant and simplistic way of thinking about what's happening without getting too critical in the sense that painting is dead or it's alive. We are in a system where there is no singular system in charge, where you can think of it in terms of neoclassical economics, where a single person is in charge, something moves out of equilibrium, it can be fixed. We're in an evolutionary adaptive system where the hierarchies have been dismantled. There are many people in charge for short periods of time, but they're connected in this network that sort of can communicate to each other and respond to situations. And accepting that as a new ecology for an environment in which we live is very difficult for us to wrap around because we want to accept that uh, someone's in charge, that there is order, there isn't, there's chaos, and in that chaos, each and every one of us has a little bit more power if we network together and communicate to essentially establish order. So we're all essentially become responsible uh, for the world, the environment, as well as for the, for the, for the distribution of cultural production that is no, no longer hegemonically controlled institutionally, academically, or in the retail space by, by, by singular powerful gallery systems. Carolina, you critique art. How does everything you just heard relate to your job as a critic of art? Mm. I mean, I, one. I, I'm going to halfway address that, but I also want to address your question about why art and why this moment in Los Angeles. And the first thing is I think we have to be careful not to drink our own Kool-Aid. I mean, the biggest economic sector in Los Angeles is manufacturing. Art is nowhere even close to that in terms of providing jobs. It's a few hundred thousand jobs in Los Angeles if you look at the Otis Report versus the sort of vast millions that live here. So I think you know, barring those New York Times style stories aside, it's not as big as we think it is. It just gets a lot of press. Um, the other thing is, yes, the ecology has changed. I think there is le a certain, there's less of certain institutional types of control, but I think that the expansions that we're seeing in terms of some of the spaces, you know, it's all still pretty 1%. Like, yeah, okay, all these museums are opening everywhere. Like Eli Broad has a museum and Peter Brandt has a museum and Jacques Duano has a, a, a museum, but they all represent a pretty elite sort of highfalutin Cesar, segment of Cesar, our... Cesar Garcia has a museum. Cesar, uh, I think of that more of as a Kunst Hall, but... Okay. but, but it, a Agreed. System. Agreed. But I think, but I also think that we just need to think carefully about like when we bandy all of these names of all of these new museums out there. The private museums. That generally. a lot of them are private museums, you know, that benefit private collectors who then don't pay taxes on those purchases. You know, like there's all of this stuff that that goes into that in terms of like reputation burnishing. That yeah, it's culture. It adds to the scene, um, but that it, it's all coming from sort of like this market-driven segment. Of, of society that isn't that we surprising. Have the, we have the typical 1% argument here. So the op we have the typical 1% argument, oppositional, rich versus poor, alienation. It's not as good as it sounds. Very dangerous conversation. Well, I don't, I don't think I said that at all. I think that a big part of the private museum growth can be accounted to that. Are there all kinds of other spaces that have come up during this time? Absolutely. Are there alternative art spaces? Are there Kunsthals like Caesars? I didn't, I didn't, I, I in no way said that this was the only sector of growth. So that must be something that perhaps you're sensitive to. I'm very sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> and while he, well, let, but let's I, go Stephen. I, I accept fundamentally that art is part of the 1% and that this is a conversation. We all sitting in this audience are part of the 1%. You know? Well, I think that's wishful thinking in my case. But in, but in any event, the one percent, it's, it's, it's the one thousand percent that's driving it. And it's worldwide, it's astonishing, and it's driven up the prices to, I, I mean, Modigliani sold the other day for $170 million. So there, it's, there, it's an asset class, it's not as transparent as money, and so these, uh, the thousand percentile, they're trading in this in the, in the art. They're building their own museums, and it's a, and then they're displaying it. It's a sport for the uh, for the common people to come and see. It, you know, when I went to New York for the opening of the Whitney, the next day, there the new Whitney. The next day, there were the, the line was a, a half mile around the block in Lower Manhattan. Uh, 
the Broad, I understand. I mean, I went to the uh, to one of the openings, but the Broad also had uh, a mass crowd. So you know, in a way, they're showing off uh, as if it were a racetrack or something like that, and they own the horses. Carolina, is that a fair um, assessment? Yeah, there. I think that that is fair. It's like who's got more coons. You know, there is a lot of that. This is such a boring on. conversation. But I mean, going back to addressing your thing about the bonsai, I don't, I, I don't think art is exclusively a one percent thing. I mean, you said that just by us being here, we are that. I think art addresses much bigger things. It includes a much bigger cohort of the population. It doesn't just include stuff that sells in galleries. I just and I think it's worth remembering that. I mean, I just, I just spent a week in Tijuana, like talking to artists and architects who are really thinking about the way art and design and all of these things can help rebuild their city in the wave of appalling narco violence in 2008 to 2010. So is it just a pretty picture that hangs on a wall and sells for 170 million? Like, I don't buy that. And, and I feel like that's th something that I try to reflect in my coverage. I just have to define this as one percenting. How many of you in the room have a cell phone with a camera on it? Lift up your hands. Okay. You're part of the 1%. But actually, actually, the other thing that I'm interested in is... Um, <laughs> Globally speaking. How, however, within this room, there'll be those that, that buy art and those that go and observe it and enjoy it in museums. And I guess one of the other things I'm interested in, and Carolina, you must be constantly looking for this, is sort of what... In fact, Stefan and Carolina in, and Stephen, all in your different ways, you were engaged with trying to identify what is the art that somehow reflects our generation. What's the good art? This art is sort of bandied around. It's partly an asset. Um, and, and, and yet, uh, there, and there's, uh, is, is there a glut? I should ask, is there a glut in this asset? And Well, is there a glut? The, the, the problem is there's actually a shortage. The Modigliani, there are very few of those in private hands. And the one, the one that sold was superb. It was a new. It wasn't thing. superb. It was painted well, over. It was a shitty second rate painting. The guy I paid totally 170 million. <laughs> I was totally I disagree. Had, I had lunch with Irving Blum and a couple of professional dealers today. It was a second rate painting, but you're a professional, so it was a masterpiece because no, the guy no, paid 170 Stefan, million for it. But Stefan, if if indeed it is second rate, then why did it sell for so it's much? A, this is the kind of conversation. that's a complete waste of time. We're talking about some Chinese taxi driver who speculated in the stock market for a decade and spends $170 million on a Modigliani because he wants to be a big shot. It's irrelevant. It's a random event. It's a black swan event. It's like being struck by lightning when walking the cat. Is it's it bullshit. a black swan and then, this is, and then this is the central conversation. A Modigliani sold for $170 million. Wow. Let's discuss art. Let's discuss Cesar Garcia. Let's discuss what's actually happening. The Modigliani is a rich guy went shopping. Happens in Paris today, probably. A guy bought his wife a rock for $12 million. It happens everywhere. Well, except it's cyclical. It's not cyclical. Throughout history, crazy rich mother f have made a lot of money and have gone and, and spent more than they should have on things. Happened with the Japanese. Are those people your buyers? I hope so. I try to recruit them. I'm in the business to make money and support emerging contemporary art, which I do. The more money I make, the more art I can support. You know, I'm in business. I mean, it's a, it's a massive business at this point. And it's... And it's, it's affecting everybody. Like I said, look at the crowds. But, yeah, uh, we're, we're seeing, we're seeing, uh, you know, you got, you got to look at what's coming out, all the art schools, all the people who are struggling. There's got to be... We're yeah, seeing the biggest happen, expansion in post-war art production in history. We're seeing more art schools, more artists making a living making art than ever before That's in history. Right. We're seeing more money flowing to young artists, mid-career artists than ever before. We're not seeing some kind of conspiracy of everyone's just buying $170 million. There's the reason why art degrees have pr proliferated, curatorial studies degrees have proliferated, is because there's more money in art flowing across the entire food chain than ever before. Okay, that's really interesting, because Carolina just... I, I think that money in the food chain benefits the artists at the top of the chain, the Jeff Koons is at Al, more than it benefits it everybody. Benefits I mean, the vast the, uh, majority of it, artists... It, it, it benefits me, the finish, Ronnie Horns and the Oscar Morillos. Let me finish Marillos. my point, is that most, the vast majority of artists do not make a living at artists once Thank they graduate God, because from they're useless. <laughs> this is the man who loves art. 
I love art. It doesn't mean I, I, I like I like good art, not bad art. Why, why should the guy make shitty art make money? It's like it's a conspiracy. You're held back. You you make bad art. There are a lot of guys who are making hundreds of thousands of dollars making art. David Cordy, hundreds of guys making making livings well beyond regular livings today, more than ever before in history. And yeah, there's this like conspiracy that I didn't make a living in art or writers or critics because they're friends with artists and they feel they've been been alienated. They always said that. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of bad art out there. But I Steph see a lot of shitty art, unfortunately. But Stefan, also, you do... It's so subjective that I don't think we can really say that. It's not a subject... I didn't he say it's a second-rate art. I said the piece was. I said the piece was painted over and probably not worth 170 million. It's, it's so subjective that I think it's hard to say that this is bad piece of art. Or this it's not subjective. It's not subjective. I, I, I tell you something. I do yoga. I can't touch my toes. Last year, my resolution was to try and touch my toes. I still can't do it. You know what? Aesthetics is a practice. The more you see, the better you see. And the subjectivity of art means I was born uh, trading aluminum in Russia and made a couple of billion dollars and I'm 50 now, I'm bored, I'm going through my third marriage, I want to be an art collector, but I've got great taste. I bought it, I paid 150 million for it, therefore it's good. No, you got bad taste. It is a muscle. It's a, it's a, it, it's the, yeah, he likes it. Some, some people like doing drugs and eating chocolate cake. I mean, but, but, but because you like it, it doesn't, because you like it, it doesn't mean it's good. It just means you like it. It's irrelevant. That, that, that's the subjective morality of if you like it, it's good. But actually, I think, okay, okay. We've Consensus is built by professionals who look at art all day long, write about art and look at, look at art. I want to ask Carolina, because Carolina I, does look at art. I, I think, I mean, long. I see a lot of crappy art, and I see a lot of crappy art in some good museums and good galleries. I think, I think, less, I think about it less as liking art than in thinking about longevity, that when you think about the works of art that have power, that continue to have power hundreds of years after they were made, it's not necessarily the stuff that was hot at the moment. I mean, I think, you know, there's a great book by Ross Kingdom called The Judgment of Paris, uh, which talks about the rise of the Impressionists and how basically nobody would take them seriously when they first came out. And uh, in the meantime, there was this great French painter, Messonnier, who was like sort of the Jeff Koons of his era. Nobody remembers him now. He was the hot guy getting the big commission, selling the paintings for a lot of money for amounts that nobody remembers today. But the work made by these guys who questioned what painting was is what lasted. So I guess when I try to, you know, it's always hard to say definitively you know, is this going to be a work with lasting resonance? You know, I don't know. I'm not going to be here in 100 years. I hope I have a good enough eye to be able to pick some of that out. But I think that's what we need to be thinking about, not like how much does it cost? Is it good? Is it not? Did so-and-so collect it? Imagine five paintings over the last 50 years that you think may have a long span. What, you want a BuzzFeed list? Is that? <laughs> <laughs> so I know. I actually wonder if, if you two. I can do that easily. Okay, who? Car Curry Archangel Gradient. Okay, Gradient by Curry Archangel. Any of you know him? He's good. Okay, Sterling Ruby spray painting, Joe Bradley abstract, Josh Smith signature painting, and one other. Let me think. Let me think. And I'll throw in Oscar Murillo. But Stefan, define why, define, define why those rise to the top. Cory Archangel basically goes to the pinwheel of, of, of Photoshop and he takes the coordinates of, of a gradient and he prints that big, 72, prints them in different sizes. It's the end of photography and ushers in sort of the age of what I believe is digital painting. It sort of ends the image and it begins it in its digital environment. It opens up essentially a, an entire platform. Josh Smith dealing with abstract expressionism and the monolithic structures of post-war art. How do you deal with being Jackson? How do you deal with being a painter in the legacy of Jackson Pollock, where painting is dead? You just take your si your, your, your signature and you sign on the painting, and you make hundreds of them, and you're, you're kind of like working out how do I be a painter in the legacy of these giants? Joe Bradley, the same thing, dealing with minimalism and pop. Uh, Oscar Murillo, I think Sterling Ruby, very similar, dealing with the legacy of Donald Judd and minimalism and how to destroy minimalism. And then Oscar Murillo, I, in, in a strange way, J uh, Joe Bradley, Sterling Ruby, Josh Smith are kind of axes that fell the tree of the post-war monolithic movements. 
Uh, Cory Archangel and Oscar Murillo are two artists who usher in essentially a new age. Uh, Cory Archangel, along with Seth Price, the sort of post-internet digital painting that essentially is dislocated from the, 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 the strong narratives of post-war art and much more open. And Oscar Murillo ushers in what I believe is the era of the aesthetics of labor exchange. Community, uh, essentially an inversion of the Warholian aesthetic, which is about commodity fetishization. And I think these five artists essentially Three of them fell the tree that lies in the past, and two of them essentially grow a new tree. Five great artists to own. Not, not the bonsai tree. The bonsai tree is a, the bonsai tree. Basically, those are like limbs. Those are like yeah. giant limbs that spread from the foundation, and then thousands of things are sprouting from that tree. And if we can have the conversation about those micro conversations that bind those things together, we have a giant art market. We have a, 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 a hugely prolific, prodigious, and expansive market on our hands. I love your analysis of those paintings. What did you think, Carolina? Mm, I'd say the end of photography came more with Richard Prince rather than Corey Archangel, but I feel like this Katie is Nolan start predates yeah, Richard Prince. That's gonna, about appropriation. It's not the like end of photography. But, but actually, I find it very interesting in as much as I do feel as if actually the market piece has been rather overwhelming. So actually yes. to hear you break it down with such passion is very exciting to me, frankly, because, cause, because I do feel as if, yes, the hordes are lining up for every new art found for institution that opens. But, but, but is there a sort of herd mentality that's being drawn to these museums? To what extent are we... Are we understanding our own time as expressed in well, art? I, th I think you know. Stefan had had a a point about uh, you know these these new artists that are exciting. But if you go if you go to the the Broad, then you'll see like uh, you know the the, the major artists. Uh, it's like they, they, they dot all the I's and Some of the major the artists, there's no and arte pover so whatsoever the, the at the broad. It's got it, giant holes. For those of us, you know, in the art world who see all this stuff all the time, it's kind of boring. But it serves a purpose for people who haven't seen this stuff, and they need to see this stuff. But, you know, what he's talking about is he's talking about a bunch of what are known as early blue chip artists, okay? There's probably about a hundred of them. In May, they were all put up uh, by the New York houses, and they sold okay. This time, they shied away from them, because what they're afraid of is if the market peaks, it's like, you know, last to be hired, first to be fired. They're the ones that are gonna, they're gonna crash, and they're gonna crash big. So I think that, you know, I would, there's a word of caution with regard to some of these artists that Stefan mentioned. But, uh, you know, certainly, uh, the fact that they're they're out there and there may be a hundred of these artists. There's not a hundred. Well, there are a hundred of them. Name them. So, of course, I'm not going <laughs> to. Of course, I'm not going to name them. But you can go to the Christie's and Sotheby's catalogs. And no, no, no and because be, because they're in they're an auction catalog, it doesn't mean they're hundred of the next blue chip It means there's an auction house that's flogging some art, and there's different names in there. It doesn't mean they're okay, the most some important. Some of art. your artists were in there, you know. Yeah, I know. So, d so, so Carolina, you went to Tijuana. They you all met did very well. There. They all did very well. D would their lives, would their careers be made, or how are they anticipating forging their careers? Are they going to be finding dealers in the big cities, getting their work into art fairs, hoping that someone like Stefan will come and discover them? What's the trajectory I now? mean, I think a, a lot of it is more sort of community focused and a little bit more focused on sort of Mexico City. Sort of when they're looking towards the art market, they probably look more towards Mexico City than they look towards the US. That said, you know, one of the artists I met with had uh, a dealer here in Culver City. Others work more as installation artists because you know, the work that they do isn't necessarily commercial. So, uh, you know, doing installations at universities, at museums, at Kunsthals, um, really this kind of wide range of practices, but I'd say the vast majority of it not supported by the market, partially because I think the market is me in Mexico is a little small and then when big Mexican buyers go to buy, they buy kind of the same global blue chip artists um, that everybody else does. So, so I, it's, it's a different part of the ecosystem, I think. You not know? true. I have many clients in Mexico. What's not true? 
the part about the blue chip? The, 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 this definition of blue chip is as well one of the broadly misused and abused definitions. But it's kind of this global type of buying. It's like a, co uh, a you do meet collectors, say, in Tijuana, who don't buy the local artists. They go to New York to buy. They go to, you Regional know, Sonamaco to buy. They're not buying, you know, people Re there. And it's so, Thank okay, God. are they blue chip? Maybe not. They're at all uh, levels of the know. gallery range, but they're sort of looking at sort of what are the greater art world trends this and sort is, of hooking into those. This is one of the moral problems, regional buying. Because you're in a region, you should buy your regional artists and support your local arts community. You should support the best art. We're in a global environment that's networked together. I'm, with I'm the merely <laughs> describing the reality for these artists. The but reality is tough. I'm not, not dictating what a collector should buy by but any means. But you're also means. assuming a definition of what constitutes as best. And this seems to be something that you think is... Uh, very clear. The, the periphery is the new center. The, the, the great young Mexican artists, Colombian, African artists, appear in the network today because of social media, because of image distribution in a very efficient way. And as those forces erupt and emerge, you're going to be able to establish whether they have visibility and power. And the conversation of like regional collecting and small, I, I, I'm very interested in a different dialogue. I'm interested in identifying the next waves, the next movements, the next, whether micro trends or macro trends. Very different. I think this like regionalism of supporting artists in LA because they happen to be in LA and because it's convenient or Mexico. I think you've got to build a net over the entire world from Iceland to Ghana basically. And you've got to then use the network to look at who is making something interesting, who's saying something interesting, and then you bring them into the network. So the distribution can be anywhere. Then these, co these conversations sort of occupy two poles. One is the polarity of the auction houses and their $100 million sales and whether things go uh, sell or don't sell or up and down. And then the polarity of regional art collecting that sort of tries to sort of define why aren't these regional artists making it or why they're under-supported. And then you sort of construct this moral episode where it's because the rich guys are buying blue chip, which is really poorly defined. And you end up with this narrative of false conflict that doesn't actually let you dig into the flesh and understand what's actually happened to look at the plumbing and the bone and the sinew and figure out how to operate within it because we're having these sort of, e sort of e exaggerated conversations that take us nowhere. And they're consistent. The press likes writing about the auctions and how much money something, so, or they like writing about how alienation and et cetera, et cetera. A guy built a giant cheese grater downtown and put a couple of billion dollars of art there. There's going to be lines around the block for the next year. <laughs> I guess what I'm interested in is, uh, well, speaking to regional art. So there's this show where Stephen and I met, New Objectivity. I, I found it profoundly moving. It com comes from a group of artists concentrated in a small period of time, in a small geographic area, and it has become completely sort of era-defining. It's become an important epoch in art. Are we seeing that emerge now i wouldn't know where to look are we what what to what extent is the art that you're identifying and buying to what extent is it telling the story of our time or i get i know that's a very dumb probably question but i i came out of that show thinking where do i find that now i, f I find the well i think you know there was there was paris there was new york and all of these artists the abex artists they had a dialogue with each other. In Los Angeles, the Venice artists, some of them are from that generation that I represent, the same thing. Billy Al Bankston's the Ed, Ed Moses, uh, Robert Irwin. They all had a dialogue with each other. So it's really important in Paris, uh, you know, Modigliani was there with a whole bunch of other important artists that emerged at the time. So the communities are important, but we are living in an instantaneous world, a global world, and so I don't know that there is any center anymore. It, you know, the, art, the art world is a global world, and it's a global market. And so artists can get on Instagram and have dialogue with each other. So it's very exciting. What I'm saying is all these artists are emerging. There's a, a proliferation of art schools and so forth. And what you have is you have the opportunity. When I, OK, so they're called early blue chip artists. OK, maybe that's the wrong word. but. You know who we're talking about. He mentioned a number of them. One of them, Oscar Murillo, he represents. So. I don't represent him. Okay, well. <laughs> I just want them out of the Whatever, you're close with them. You're, you're, you're close. Okay. 
but I, but so I think that's great. But I just, you know, there's a note of caution because, because the art market, yeah, he's he's at auction, Marilla. Now he's it's at Sotheby's, Christie's, whatever, and the bottom could drop out tomorrow. So then what? So so the point is, it's great, but it's cyclical too. Back to back to sort of the positioning of art. So in one of the, the earlier panels, a, a sort of pre-DM panel that we did, we talked to a bunch of designers who are working for essentially absentee um, homeowners for whom these designers are decorating the fifth house. And they're buying art that goes in the fifth house. They're also working for new tech billionaires who are 25 and have no clue about art and um, one of the designers tells a story of driving around San Francisco with 20 million dollars worth of art sitting in the back of the truck that he's driving to this guy's house. It's like a story of our time but basically the art has become completely integral with the with the property with the wine collection. Um, it's this uh, and and where are these guys who are sort of what, what part of the e ecosystem does this belong in? What part of the bonsai tree? Sh shopping. <laughs> Sh shopping. I mean, I, I think this has always, this has always happened. I mean, it's what Norton Simon did. He went out and like bought out the Duveen brothers in New York City and he filled his museum with it in Pasadena. It's like the idea that some people buy for something other than being engaged with the ideas and the art, I think is probably not new. It's probably old as time. But are we seeing a kind of explosion right now, a very hot moment for all of this right now? I mean, I think it's hot, but I also feel like everything just gets magnified by sort of the media gaze, you know, and I don't, I, I don't follow auctions, so I should probably hand this off to you. Well, yeah, I think, I think that's one of the problems, okay? I mean, what they're doing is, again, it's an asset class, so what they're doing is they're buying these works of art Sometimes they never even see them. There's fireproof vaults in Switzerland, in Dubai, and they're putting the, they're putting the, they never even see the art. They, I, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not even on their wall. I mean, so, so they buy and sell, like Steve Cohn, uh, the billionaire from the hedge funds, was selling uh, a number of works that made records. A Fontana, I think, maybe was one of his. Uh, that sold at $29 million. Yeah, these, these works of art are just, so it's, an, so it's like an asset class. And they're not, they don't care what's on their sofa, I mean, at that level. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's astonishing. But there's also a lack, the reason it's, it's being done is there's a lack of transparency. Yeah, the, the secondary market, you don't see really what's going on. Uh, and when you're talking about numbers like that, they can offshore the art and offshore their, uh, their assets. And are those assets affected by, um, say, I guess you and I s t were talking um, this week about, I guess Snapchat has been slightly devalued. These unicorns in the tech well, world well, we're, are... We're seeing, we're seeing, I think what happened, for example, in May, we saw a bill, uh, Christie's did a billion dollars. In November, just now, they did about half of that. And so what you're, what you're seeing is, and you're seeing Steve Cohn selling all these works. So there's some thought that right now the market's at the top. The, the, uh, it, it correlates with the stock market. And probably, I would think, it seems as if it, the thinking now is that it peaked in May. Who cares? When well, it peaked, I mean, if it's cyclical, if it goes up, who gives a damn? There are 560, there are 563 market. billionaires in China, 512 right. billionaires in America. Competing. They're not competing, they're going on a shopping spree. Do you write about it when a rich guy basically goes and buys some uh, champagne at the liquor store and pays $50,000? It's the same thing. The guy's got a truck with $20 million of art. I go and buy a poster when I'm in college. I put it on the wall. If I've got $10 billion that I stole from uh, some resource deal in Nigeria, I'm going to go and spend $20 million. I've, I know people who've spent $1 million on parties. It's irrelevant. It's, why discuss the shopping sprees of the rich? They're irrelevant. They make markets up and down, but you basically have th 2,000 billionaires who are shopping. Hey, I want this, I want this. It's, it's meaningless. Who cares? It's not discussing art. They went shopping. 
I mean, you know, you might as well start writing about some guy goes to Maxfields well, and blows two million dollars. No, no, but it's not divorced from from real estate markets. It's Why? Because divorced. it's culture and it occupies a higher moral plane. No, because it affects the rents and pri real estate prices all down the chain. You know, the, it's not completely a separate and isolated market. So there is a market impact. But why are we even prices? talking about? Let's talk about art. Why we? We talking about? What are we talking about? Stephen Stephen Goldberg's analysis of Christie's billion-dollar sales. Who gives a damn? Let's well, talk about something that point, actually is meaningful. The point is, it's a business. What he's, so he's giving you a lecture on, on art as a cyclical investment? Was he a stockbroker saying, buy art now, sell art now? Who cares? Makes a difference to you guys? There's no conspiracy. They're buying shit and selling shit. So have the losses. The losses have grown as quickly as the profits. For as many people you know, have made money, me, many people have lost money. They just don't write about it. Let me jump in here. You know, you know the point. The point is, art is art is a business. Okay. If you don't think it's a business, then you're you're a fool. And the, but what what's good about it is that because of this, because of this thousandth of one percent and the frenzy in the art market and so forth. It's giving artists a, a, around the world a chance to break through, and there's so so it's a in a way it's a good thing. Okay, that's the th and then you can talk about the real beauty of art, the real uh, the real meaning of art. And I mean, uh, you don't like this particular Modigliani, but frankly, it's astonishing to look at it in person to see it. It's just, it's absolutely stunning. If you've gone to a show of his work, a singular show of his work, you'll come out of there feeling incredible for, because of what you've seen. That's the, that's the importance of art. It's not the money, but the money is but the But the painting you're you fixated on discussing you is the importance that. of art. It's the second most expensive painting ever sold. You're discussing... Hey, by, by Already. Yeah, yeah. I want to. I want to ask. I think. I think Stephen uh, nailed what really ultimately is the meaning of art: the desire, the the, the somehow one's elevated by it. Carolina, the artist that you've seen recently. Uh, who who are you? Are you finding yourself really excited by and moved by some of the art that you're seeing? Or are you finding that artists are feeling they've got to play the game somehow, break into the art market? Yeah. And what does that mean? Does it affect the work they do? The art fairs, is it making them change the size of their paintings because they have to like be Like a Barbara Coughlin novel over here. <laughs> I mean, there, there is a lot of sort of playing the game of like, oh, I'm going to make work that can sell or I'm going to make work that sort of speaks to a certain part of the art world. But I think for me, though, always the most interesting art is the art in which the artist is just, just doing something that they feel passionately about or really making a statement about something. And so, you know, when I think about the works that I've seen that recently that have really moved me, I mean, their works, they've, they've been these almost like ephemeral pieces that... Like I saw an installation at Lace by the artist Natalie Bookchin uh, that dealt with all of these like harvested pieces of YouTube video that dealt with questions of scandal. And it was this kind of maze that you navigated in the dark and you had these different voices that would come on and talk at you. I mean, it is this piece that to this day, I wish some museum would stage it because I think it's a really important work that talks about sort of the social movement, the social moment that we're living in. I mean, is it, you know, is it generating the headlines about money and sales and this and that? No, it isn't. But I do find that work there. And I find it when the artists make things they care about and don't think about all of the accoutrement, you know. Is that bad? Well, she cares, she cares about, I think Natalie Bookchin cares, but she doesn't care so much about how much her work costs or what people are going to write about it. It's more how is it going to be received by a certain kind of viewer. That's what she cares about. What is she going to say with this work? The, the, piece, the piece did get reviews. And she's an artist who does not produce very much. Her pieces are, are very sort of like laborious and, and they take years to complete. So it might be one work every two or three years, but she does get reviewed, she does get grants, and, and she is out there. You know. But how does an artist, I mean, it's, you know, I'm looking at all of you, you know, people, um, but how does an artist, 
how does an artist navigate all of these different issues that you're discussing? It's, um, you know, you make it, sure being you from this point of view as an artist listening to, to you all. Um, you make good art. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, but it, that's not the get navigation yeah. part. I mean, I think, I think there's... Well, but it Stefan, didn't work for Van Gogh. Um, <laughs> there's also the fact of luck. Luck. You, you can be as integral as you want, and you really do great art. Everybody yeah. around is sees it and likes it. But, but the, the, you shoot it out, it's luck. There's Helmut Klint. You know Helmut Klint? Helmut Klint, Swedish artist. The precursor to Paul Klee was doing very similar work. She was a female. She never showed art. She passed away. The work is, do you know Helma F. Clint? I do not. Uh, Helma F. Clint, H-A-L-M-A F. Clint. She's considered as great as Paul Clay. The Swedish state owns all the work. She was undiscovered for 100 years. She was a woman. She never even thought of showing art. She passed, uh, and, and, and they literally in the last decade released it. So she's massive now. Eventually, the good art gets found, as long as it doesn't get burnt or destroyed in the tunnels of history. But eventually, it gets discovered. Henry Darger, the same. Uh, you know, I, I really do believe if the art is great, it eventually profoundly rises to the top. I mean, I think, but I think in terms for artists working today, there's sometimes a conscientious decision that has to be made about like, okay, do I choose to pursue a gallery career? Do I go the academic route? I mean, there are choices that yeah. they make about, you know, will I be a, an artist who survives on grants and does installation work, or, or am I, you know, am I gonna be more commercial? Like, there are decisions but that go into it, and I, think, and I think a lot of them stem from the type of work an individual artist makes, and also what their own feelings can, about what they wanna do can as I give well. You my, can I give you my theory, just in mm -hmm. two seconds? So Marcel Duchamp talks about, basically, art being produced in its raw state, a la brute, good, bad, or indifferent and it gets transmitted through time and space. Eventually it gets refined like sugar, molasses into refined sugar. What's happened because of this thing here is that process has accelerated rapidly. So instead of separating this idea of art production and distribution over long elongated periods of time, it is compressed. The discussion of cultural production and cultural distribution, in my opinion, needs to be bound together, studied, examined, and discussed as a singular unit. Now what happens when you do that, you start to infect the production of culture with the infection of the distribution of culture, because the distribution of culture is infused with morality, as we talk to you, buy it because you love it. We get into the Barbara Cartland conversation of why you buy art. I bought it because I love you. I love you, let's get married. <laughs> you know, It's like this romance, and there's no romance. Artists are either doing important work and good work. It's not a romance novel they're writing, they're making art. And the discussion of cultural distribution and cultural production needs to be discussed and understood methodically. What's different today to the past is that compression, that speed, the bonsai tree, the distance between the leaf and the branch is small now. The difference between a tree at the foundation and the first leaf is great. And that's why I like the analogy of the tree, because it really helps you define and think about these structures across the board. My definition of important. I think art is a language that progresses and moves us through. Through it, it, it is the reflection. It's the cultural reflection of our output as a race, technologically, politically, socially. And art that is important is that which perfectly reflects, in perfect synchronicity, those movements of time and space as they happen. It's like riding a wave. It's like surfing. They're giant waves that occur. And those great artists are those, those, those guys who are literally they, at, at, at the top of the wave, ready to ride it. And those are the guys who make history. And that's what I look for. We, <laughs> we definitely c should be drawing to a close. I would like Carolina and Stephen to um, give concluding points. But I do want to ask, are there any more questions? Are there any burning questions? Do we have time for two or three questions or no? Because it's two or three, two or three questions. Th th let's give it to the lady who's not yet asked a question today, if that's yeah, okay. Um, I just think there's so much important art that is totally out of the gallery system. There are so many artists that are working with uh, public art versus at the art groups that I do, working with people who transform the society through community, where it's the process that's so important, and community building. And
that's very different from what Stefan thinks. No, it's um, not. No, I feel like I play with kids and I do large murals and I have but a... But this is a basis for humanity. Mm. That should be involved in how we mm. eat food, how we cook food, how we consume yeah, everything. Yeah, and I have a mural in the farmer's market yeah. that's no. like two, uh, probably 200 panels made by kids from homeless street kids in Brazil to uh, people in the, in the Andes in, in Peru and then kids from Hancock Park Elementary School. And it's just so important to teach them um, art, but also about how to get along with other people. It's the aesthetics of labor exchange. Oscar Murillo did an amazing project where he went to countries all over the world and put fabric and canvas on students' desks from Uganda right. to Colombia. And they were assembled in Venice. There are now 5,000 of them. It's a foundation called Frequencies. The aesthetics of labor exchange inverts the Warholian aesthetic and brings together these exchanges of labor and family and movements together in a way. You're 100% right. It's not what I'm against. Don't, don't, don't confuse my capitalist business-minded tendencies with my lack of understanding. No, no, no. Yeah, because like, I live off of 1% for the arts for grants. And I, but to get the money, we need to be practical. Right, if we're impractical, we're basically singing a song on the but side of the so street. Hard to get the money. Yeah. That's, that's the hard Stefan, all I saw was the difference was what, what, this, what, what this audience member is saying is that um, the process, or, or the art is of value for all who engage with it. But you've said the only art that matters is good art. That's art different. That, no, the only art that, I'm a businessman. I am trying to accumulate art assets that one day will have massive institutional capital. I want to make a lot of money. So what's important for me is different to what's important for a community outreach program. It doesn't mean I don't, th I don't think what the community outreach program is important. But here I am in business wanting to do something very specific with my life and time. It doesn't mean I deny the importance of what you, and it doesn't mean that artists will not integrate in community outreach right. programs and infuse in their practice things that make those community outreach programs good. I work with artists in Africa all over the show who are doing amazing projects. We basically financed a, 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 a beautiful library that got flooded in Ghana recently. So yes, the, the, the goodness comes out of it, but it comes out from, through, through practical leadership. But in terms of you and your aspirations, will you be uh, Messalina, the, 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 friend, the guy that made all the money when, at the time of the French Impressions, who everybody's forgotten? Oh, Messonnier. Me Messonnier. <laughs> Messonnier. Will, will, is your model to be a Messonnier making tons of money now, or is your model to be the guy that supports Van Gogh or something? I have no goddamn idea. I'm just working hard to keep myself afloat. <laughs> 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 I was a fortune teller <laughs> I mean, I just wanted to add something to what this audience member said, because if you do see an interesting current in what's happening art to, in art today, is a lot of artists sort of engaging social issues in works that are all about process. I mean, this is work that goes back to the work that Suzanne Lacey was doing here in Los Angeles in like the 1970s, you know, involving community members in, in sort of like wide ranging projects that had everything to do with uh, women's issues, um, issues of race and class, uh, adolescence, and stuff that was more about bringing people together than creating an object. So that is kind of an interesting, and I think, yeah, but I mean, I think this social aspect is something interesting because it's something that a lot of artists like right now, I think as because there is so much attention on the art market, there is also, you do see these art artists who say, no, my, my work is going to be not necessarily geared at that. It's going to be about this process, but this process that entails community. Yeah, I mean so years ago. Good Question. for you. We should move. JR's project of urban renewal is amazing. The street artist, JR. I want to ask you, I want to look at that. JR's incredible. You know JR? His work is fascinating. I think one more question. We better keep it short. I just have a, a statement. Keep it a short statement. It'll be a short statement. <laughs> um, I think it's great. I apologize I came in late, but when I came in, I was very kind of upset that there seemed to be uh, a discussion of an either or discussion, either we do money or we do art. I think you have to do both. I don't think it's an either Oh, or. that's what everybody's that's agreed, I think. Everybody's agreed. Um, we, we could continue, but I think we should wrap it up and get a drink. And still... <laughs> Drink up the road at Christmas.
Christopher Guy. Stephen, did you want to say anything else? And did you well, see that Modigliani, by the way? Well, that dreadful second-rate Modigliani. <laughs> no, no, it's going, it's, going to, it's going to China, so I don't know well, that I'm going to be able to see it. But, I, but you know, I do want to emphasize, and you, and you, just, you saw that, you know, you saw that, that, he, that he's ultimately revealed himself to be a businessman as well. With yeah. all the, by, by the with way, all anyone, I think he's revealed anyone can Barbara reach Collins. me. Simkovitz at Gmail. Yeah. My number's public. Just Google me. <laughs> Clients, collectors, customers, anyone. Right. You see the businessman at work. So it's not all about aesthetics after all. But the point that, but the point that I'm making is, we're, you know, if you're if you're involved in the art world, there's a reason why you're involved in the art world, and it's not it should be not just because there's a lot of money involved there, but if you see something, when I go into a gallery, it doesn't happen very often, but suddenly you see the most incredible, extraordinary thing, and you feel fantastic. It makes you feel good. <laughs> no, you don't, actually. <laughs> so anyway, I, I would say that that's really what it's all about. What it's all about is the excitement that you get in seeing the incredible new art, and now you can see it in many, many different ways, as I said, even on Instagram. So it's, that's what, that's what I, I think excites everybody here, and, but, but we can't divorce it from It is a big business, a big global business, and it's helping, it's, in the end, it's helping everybody, I think. Stephen Goldberg, thank you so much. Attorney, <laughs> art lawyer, re writes regularly for Artillery Magazine. Carolina Miranda, read her in the LA Times. Stefan Simkowitz. <laughs> Everyone, um, just one second. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen me do the song and dance, I'm Darren Gold. I'm the chair of the West Hollywood Design District, and I want to thank you all for coming. This is an amazing day. There's always one panel that kind of has this energy, and so thank you all for bringing that. And I want to thank Mallory Roberts Morgan and Francis Anderton, our co-curators, for such a wonderful day full of great panels. And, and now join us all, Christopher Guy, for a closing party. Thank you all.